Hello, my name is Sue Whiting and I'm a children's book author. Welcome to Picture Book Nook. I've been writing books for kids for about 20 years now. I write books for big kids and little kids and somewhere in between kids. Ah! It's my great pleasure today to introduce my brand new picture book, Good Question, A Tale Told Backwards, illustrated by Annie White and published by Walker Books Australia. Now, Good Question is the story of a hungry fox, a very hungry fox who stumbles into all the wrong stories. And as the title suggests, it's a story about questions, good questions to be precise. And by the end of the story, I think my foxy character might just shed some light on a question that I've been wondering about since I was a wee lass. And that is, why did that acorn fall on Henny Penny's head to begin with? Questions are so important to storytellers and writers. In fact, asking questions is how writers develop their stories to start with. All those who, what, when, why type questions. And like many of my stories, good question started with a question, a why type question. A why type question that I asked myself when I found this photo of a fox perched high in the top of a tree. His foxy eyes were looking straight at me as if daring me to tell his story. And I asked myself the question, why is that fox up in the tree? And an answer came straight back at me. He's hiding, of course, from the giant. Oh, that was surprising. So I asked another question. Why is he hiding from the giant? Because the giant thinks he has his golden goose. Ah, that's interesting. So that's how the story got started, with me asking questions, jotting down the answers, trying to surprise myself each time, until eventually all these questions and answers started to come together and to form some kind of story. But truth be told, it wasn't until I handed over the reins to this foxy character and let him tell his own story in his own foxy way that the story really started to take shape. And before long, it was time to hand over the story to the wonderfully talented Annie White, pictured here. Annie and I worked together on Beware the Deep Dark Forest, so I was super excited to be doing another book together. This is one of Annie's first sketches of the fox up in the tree, and I immediately fell in love. And here is the final illustration in beautiful full colour. And just like the fox that inspired the story, Annie's fox gazes into your eyes, daring you to ask the question, why is that fox up in the tree? Annie had to create many characters for this story, and some were rather challenging. And I think Annie would agree that the most challenging of all was the fairy godmother. It was all my fault, really. You see, I didn't want this fairy godmother to be your typical fairy godmother. So in my story, I gave her a hot temper and spiderweb hair and a whiskery chin. <laughs> Poor Annie. She had several goes before she created this fabulous character, who ended up being one of my favourites. Here is the fairy tale world that Annie created for the end papers. The winding path you can see maps Fox's fateful journey through Storyland. Can you spot the three bears? What about the three pigs and the big bad wolf? Jack and the Beanstalk? And of course, that fiery fairy godmother. Good Question is a book filled with questions and answers. It celebrates story and storytelling and storytellers. And I really hope that young readers will delight in predicting 
Fox's answers to all the questions within. And that maybe they might even be inspired to create their own stories by asking questions and finding answers. So that ends my story about my story good question. If you're interested, there are teacher's notes and also a blog post about how to use good question as a mentor text on my website. But right now, over there, there's a girl called Pearlie, a pig, a polar bear, and a whole stack of penguins who are demanding my attention. So I better head off. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, welcome to Story Scoop. My name's Leanne Tanner and I write books. I've written books about a museum where all the wild things go to hide, an ancient ship and an outcast girl, a city where no one believes in magic even though it's all around them, a girl who's never seen the ocean, and a small scruffy chook with very big ambitions. When I go into schools, I get asked a lot of questions, but the question that comes up more than any others is, where do you get your ideas from? And I really like that question because I get my ideas from all over the place. I get them from dreams, from other people's books, from people I meet and places I go and things I see. But I've found that some of my most interesting ideas happen when I take two things that I like, but that have absolutely nothing to do with each other and put them together. And sometimes when I do that, I get this feeling like... And then I know it's a great idea. So, I really like chooks. I also really like detective stories, but there's obviously no way I could put those two things together. I mean, chooks and detectives. Mm -mm, it's just not going to work. Not unless, not unless I wrote a story about a chook who wants to be a detective. Wait, is that even possible? I mean, why would a chook want to be a detective? How would she go about it? And what on earth was I going to call her? Oh, hang on, I could answer that last one because I used to have three chooks, and their names were Dolly, Floss, and Clara. Clara was the smallest, but she was also the smartest and the bravest. She was always the first one to find something interesting in the compost heap, or to spot a nest of earwigs. And when my cat Harry came too close, she'd stare at him until he backed away with his ears flat and his tail twitching. So when I found myself writing a story about a small, scruffy chook with big ambitions, I had to call her Clara. <laughs> when I'm dreaming up a new book, I always make a mess, and this was no exception. My Clara notebook is full of scribbles and arrows and mess and questions, lots and lots of questions, like, are there words Clara doesn't understand? Uh, what's her opinion on television, mobile phones and ducks? And where exactly is this story taking place? Luckily, my trusty assistant Harry was there to help with the answers. We decided to set the story in a small country town called Little Dismal. Now, I love maps, especially in the fronts of books. I love being able to read the story and then flick back to the front to see exactly where things are happening. So. I drew a rough map of Little Dismal, and illustrator Cheryl Orsini turned it into something beautiful. Harry and I decided that the best way to tell Clara's story was to have her keep a diary, which meant she had to be able to write and tell the time. But that's not a problem for a smart little chook like Clara. Not only can she write, she's taught herself. Morse code and semaphore, and she's in the process of learning Egyptian hieroglyphics. 
Nothing's going to stop her getting what she wants, except maybe the bullying chook she lives with and a mysterious master criminal. So, once we had the story, Harry and I had to find the right title, and it took a while. Mm, not bad, but no. Oh, okay, that's cute. Like the X-Files, right? Mm, except maybe kids won't get the reference. Yes, I love it. Another thing I love is seeing what an illustrator makes of my characters. And Cheryl Orsini did an amazing job of drawing Clara as she set about the business of becoming a detective. Now, chooks don't usually become detectives, so Clara ended up as a pretty funny story. But as I was writing it, I realised that it was also a story about loneliness and friendship and how you don't have to be beautiful and famous to be loved. And that's a really nice and really important thing to be writing about. If you'd like to find out more about my books, go to my website at leantanner.com. You can also leave a message or ask a question on my blog. Thanks everyone. I really hope you enjoy A Clue for Clara. Hi and welcome to Story Scoop. I'm Elisa Dullison and I am an author. I write lots and lots of books, so some of them are on your screen right now. I absolutely love writing and one of the joys of writing is sharing my stories. Um, I would like to talk to you today about my League of Llama series. There are four books in this series and they look amazing and they're such beautiful colours, but even more than that, they feature llamas, not just any old llamas. These llamas are secret agents. You've got Philippe Lamar, you've got Eloise Lamareski, and Lloyd Laminator. They all work for the Lama Republic government and they protect their country from evil forces like General Bottomberg, who, you guessed it, yes, he does do a lot of bottom burping. So these books are super, super funny. So I want to talk to you about writing humour. I think now more than ever, it's important that we're laughing, that we're enjoying ourselves for our own mental health and well-being, for our sense of escapism and to keep our beautiful imaginations alive. So in terms of the techniques for creating laughter and humour in my stories, I'd like to focus on three today. And these are ones that you might like to practice in your writing too. So the first one is exaggeration. This is also known as hyperbole. So when something um, happens to us in real life, we might think that, oh yes, that was funny, um, that was interesting. But when we want to build it into a story to make it really funny, to get those rib tickling humor happening, we want to use exaggeration and hyperbole. So we make everything seem bigger, funnier, crazier, sillier, loopier, until we really get our reader laughing. The second one is toilet humor, okay? It's not everyone's cup of tea, but for some reason, children love talking about farts and parping and pooping. Even just saying the word poop makes me laugh. So we can build that kind of toilet humor into our stories and it creates very funny situations that most readers will have a giggle at. Third technique I would like to talk about is where you have a silly character who misunderstands everything that he's been told. The character might not be what you call the sharpest tool in the shed, might not be the smartest character around. And this happens to be Lloyd Laminator in the League of Llamas. He's very loyal, um, he's a great guy, he supports Philippe all the time, but he's a little bit silly. He's not very clever at all. He eats 
um, his boss's couch, for instance, because it's green, he kind of thinks, well, that's healthy and tasty. It looks a bit like grass. Llamas like eating grass and hay. So he eats his boss's couch and he gets in to a lot of trouble for that. But what Lloyd also does is misunderstands basic words um, and, and small words in language. So that leads to a lot of misunderstandings and confusion. I would like to talk now about some loopy llama facts. These are things you might not know about llamas, but which I found out when I researched the stories. And I absolutely love research. I often get distracted and I go off on tangents researching, but it's so much fun and you can build a lot of the things that you research into your stories. So here are five loopy llama facts. Fact number one, llamas only have two toes two toes on each foot. Fact number two, they are part of the camelid family, which means they're related to camels. Hmm. Fact number three, llamas can make all sorts of funny and interesting noises, grunts and groans and squeaks and all sorts of things. They are hilarious. If you ever get a chance to get up close and personal with a llama, it will be a special experience, I promise. Fact number four, baby llamas are called criers and apparently those little babies can make a sound like a crying human baby. Hmm, who would have thought? And fact number five, we're back to the poop. Um, llamas tend to poop in one place in their yard. So if they're in a paddock, they'll have one little spot where all the llamas go to poop. They're very neat and very tidy in that respect. Now I bet you didn't know that fact. I didn't find that out until I visited a llama farm because it's not really in any of the books or on any of the websites where I was researching llamas. So there are five loopy llama facts. I hope you like them. Now, I would like to leave you laughing with a joke. So I have a llama inspired joke for you. What is a llama's favorite drink? Top. Drum roll, please. A llama's favorite drink is, of course, lemonade. I wonder if they like pink lemonade. I'm quite partial to it myself. Thank you very much for watching. You can pick up a copy of the League of Llamas books. There are four in the series. You can grab them at all good bookstores and at the links below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.